<laughs> so welcome to the summer 2016 um, edition of the Autonomy Incubator Student Exit Presentations. Uh, Josh Eddy has been with us now for two semesters. He was here with us last summer um, and again uh, with us this summer where he has been working in the area of visual odometry and sensor fusion. Uh, so we're happy to have Josh with us. Uh, I say from Virginia Tech and um, hand it over to Josh. Okay. All right. My name is Joshua Eddy. I am a master's student in the Department of Aerospace and Ocean Engineering at Virginia Tech, where I study things like state estimation, sensor fusion, visual odometry. Sometimes I go to class. Um, <laughs> so, I wanted to talk to you today about visual inertial navigation and state estimation for small UAS and GPS denied environments and a lot of other complicated things. Uh, so the motivation for this work I think is fairly straightforward but I want to go through it and nail it all down. So all UAS op applications from uh, the very difficult in the form of disaster relief to the perhaps very straightforward, or at least seemingly straightforward in terms of package delivery depend upon real-time localization. That part's, pre that part's pretty straightforward. Uh, as unmanned aircraft are introduced into the national airspace, we're going to need better and better positioning abilities for those aircraft, principally because unmanned traffic management, UTM, and all these other uh, technologies that are going to be coming into being are going to be dependent upon better and better localization to be able to take better advantage of the available airspace that we have and be able to better optimize traffic and keep all of these different kinds of aircraft safe in a heavily crowded and often fairly dangerous airspace. So. Sometimes GPS just isn't enough to do that. Uh, actually, it's, I, I say sometimes, it's uh, most of the time in my experience. Um, uh, unfortunately, GPS accuracy is often no more than a few meters. Uh, we have found in, fr uh, frequent in frequent flight tests that uh, GPS usually puts us in the ballpark and sometimes actually puts us within one meter, but uh, the variance is actually pretty bad, some of the time at least, and it gets steadily worse whenever you enter into a challenging locale. And of course, the vast majority of the human beings who would want to take advantage of UAS applications live in these things called cities, which are replete with urban canyons. So the availability and quality of GPS coverage are now actually a real concern for anybody who has a vested interest in UAS operation uh, and because of that I want to be able to contribute in some way to the better uh, estimation of, of, of the state of vehicles and in so doing add to better navigational abilities for those vehicles. So this is an example of uh, one of my quad charts from uh, I think about halfway through the semester. Um, I don't want to belabor any of the points on here too, too much. I just want to go over my general approach uh, to visual inertial navigation. Uh, so basically what I started out doing was uh, investigating the current state of the art, which is a number of algorithms that have come out of ETH Zurich. Uh, and after in immersing myself in the research that's come out of that institution, as well as what's come out of the GRASP lab here in the United States, um, I have been, I have started building a package, uh, which I'm going to discuss uh, in substantial detail, uh, for doing a fairly sophisticated form of uh, inertial navigation uh, sensor fusion. Uh, so I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be discussing Coleman filtering here in a second, uh, and that's really the basis for all of this sensor fusion stuff. So jumping right into it. So I'm going to start by explaining what visual inertial navigation is. I think this, fa this is fairly straightforward too, but again, I want to just nail it down. Uh, to ensure safe navigation, we need better ways of precisely localizing our vehicles. VIN, visual inertial navigation, is an attractive solution for this problem because it's hardware minimal. Uh, we can really get actually pretty great state estimates out of our vehicles, even with just the use of one camera and one IMU, and usually a fairly cheap IMU at that. Uh, so we, uh, for our hardware experiments here at the, or at the incubator, uh, we've been using just one downward facing camera and one IMU located at the center, mass, center of mass of the vehicle. And in terms of sensing, I mean, that's really not much of a hundred eyed monster, you know, that's just two sensors. Uh, and those sensors can actually be fairly degraded some of the time and we can still get good results. Uh, that's what's really great about this approach. It's basically hardware minimal. Uh, if we lose any more of those sensors, I mean, we're, we don't have much. <laughs> All right. So what is VIN? It's a fusion of vision-based data with inertial measurements. In our particular implementation, we've been using what's called PTAM, Parallel Tracking and Mapping, which is a fairly uh, popular member of a very large body of algorithms called SLAM. Uh, that stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Uh, so we've been using PTAM uh, on a downward-facing camera, as I mentioned, and we've been using an IMU that's been placed at the center of mass of the vehicle. Uh, and we've been fusing the uh, inertial measurements, those being accel linear accelerations and angular velocities, uh, with the the pose estimates that come out of the SLAM algorithm, that's PTAM. So parallel tracking and mapping, uh, I mentioned, is one of the 
uh, one of the uh, more popular SLAM algorithms. PTAM works by selecting keyframes from a video feed and then searching for very easily identifiable features in within that uh, within each of those keyframes. And then between keyframes, it tries to track the motion of those free, those features. In so doing, it produces a an ever growing map of the environment that the vehicle is in, uh, and also gives us an estimate of the ego motion of the camera. So uh, PTAM provides us with pose estimates as we are flying along and building up this map. We have found that it is actually very good. Uh, <laughs> we've had fun uh, performing a number of indoor tests. This is one that we did uh, in, within, inside the incubator. So this was performed in the largely clinical environment of our flight volume. Uh, so we were actually able to walk out the uh, initials of the autonomy incubator. And we were able to get a pretty high fidelity uh, estimate of our trajectory as we walked the vehicle around. In terms of testing, we started out indoors walking the vehicle most of the time, and then we got a little more ambitious and we started flying the vehicle around, and then we actually went outside and we spent a lot of, lot of time in the hot, hot sun. Um, uh, so we did a fair amount of flight tests outdoors, uh, which uh, swiftly exposed a number of the issues that PTAM has, principally uh, that uh, PTAM is fairly uh, memory intensive, and we have to, be, we have to uh, exer exercise a certain amount of control over just how much uh, in the way of keyframes we're handling whilst we're flying. Um, in addition to that, uh, initialization is a fairly substantial problem in that we have to initialize the algorithm under a very particular set of circumstances. We have to perform an initial translation that is of a very particular size relative to the size of our relative to the scale of our environment. Um, both of those were fairly substantial challenges that we were not really able to diagnose in great detail indoors, but became immediately apparent when we came when we went outside. So. Kalman filtering. I mentioned Kalman filtering earlier. Kalman filtering is my uh, chosen method of fusing uh, the information coming from the IMU with the pose estimates coming from the SLAM algorithm um, because I'm a masochist. Uh, so a Kalman filter is an algorithm for recursive Bayesian estimation. Uh, that's a really fancy way of saying that it produces probabilistic estimates of the, of the system, of, of the state of a system. So a Kalman filter uh, assumes that everything is normally distributed, i.e. bell curve shaped. So everything is Gaussian in Kalman filter land. Everything is also fundamentally linear in Kalman filter land, a point that I'm going to get to in further detail in a moment. Uh, it is a self-correcting iterative method of estimating the state of a system. Uh, the requirements for putting together a Kalman filter, and I always say putting together rather than running uh, because it's a number of pieces that have to be put together in a particular order and run in a particular way. Uh, your requirements are a dynamical model for whatever it is that you're trying to filter. That could be uh, the state of a vehicle or it could be the state of a commodity on the stock market or it could be the state of voltage crossing a wire. It could be any number of things. It really is kind of arbitrary. Uh, and you also need to be able to have sensor readings. You need some way to actually correct the estimates that you're producing. So with that in mind, the Kalman filter algorithm is presented here uh, in the absence of math because I am kind. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, a Kalman filter runs in two steps, those being predict and correct. So the predict step involves predicting the state and predicting the covariance associated with that state. So a covariance, to put it simply, is a matrix uh, encoding my confidence in my estimate of a state. So if I say that the state is, uh, the vehicle is on the floor and it is not moving and it is oriented towards north and it's doing this, that, and the other thing, uh, and my covariance is zero, it means I have perfect confidence in what the vehicle is doing. There is nothing wrong with it. I am right. Um, and if the covariance is very large, I am wrong. Um, and I am usually wrong. <laughs> anyway, uh, the correct phase follows the predict phase, or can actually run in front of it because it's cyclical. Um, but we are running it uh, predict followed by correct. So in the correct phase, we take in our sensor readings, those being uh, pose estimates in this case, and IMU readings. And we compute what's called the Kalman gain, which is uh, literally a, a matrix of gains that we apply to our, uh, uh, apply to our uh, innovation, which is the difference between what my sensors are reading and what I predict my sensor readings to be. So if I have some understanding of how my sensors work, I can say that my sensor observations z are going to be equal to some function h of x, uh, where x is my state. And if I have a really good understanding of how my sensors work, then I'm going to be able to produce high fidelity predictions of what my sensors will say if I know what the state is. So uh, we produce a common gain, which tells us just how far off we were in our prediction. And then the other steps are exactly what you might expect. We correct the state, and then we correct the covariance. And then we rinse and repeat. 
So the unscented Kalman filter uh, is, is now my new favorite animal. Um, so the unscented Kalman filter is a variation on the Kalman filtering algorithm that applies what's called the unscented transform. So the way that a normal Kalman filter works is you take one state and you pass it through whatever your function is that pr propagates a state through time, whatever f of x gets one x at time k to another x at time k plus one, uh, and you get whatever time, whatever x k plus one is. You find out what your next state is based on what your old state was. Uh, so the difference fundamentally here between the unscented Kalman filter and basically all the other varieties of Kalman filter is that instead of passing only one state through, I actually select several states. So if you can imagine, this gray hill is a probability density function. It's a Gaussian distribution uh, in this two-dimensional space projected up into the z spa into in as z height for how uh, probable a particular state is. So the absolute dead center of the hill is my mean state. That's where I think that I am. Uh, and the unscented Kalman filter selects a number of what are called sigma points uh, to sample this distribution. So I'll sample along one axis and along another axis. And of course, I'll take the mean state, and I will pass all all of these states through my nonlinear map, whatever my function f is that attaches one state to another state in, uh, at the next point in time, and I will produce a whole new smattering of sigma points at the next point in time. So I take five or six states in, say, and I get five or six states out, but they're all in a new kind of shotgun pattern, you might say. And from that new shotgun pattern, I can actually rebuild the covariance. I can actually re-establish what this hill should look like at the next point in time. The point of the unscented Kalman filter, uh, uh, from the in, in the words of the, its inventors, is that it is actually easier to propagate a probability density in time than it is to propagate a single state in time. So. This is the unscented transform, and that is what I do in order to propagate my state forward and propagate my sensors forward. So with that in mind, I am committing a horrible presentation sin here by putting a whole bunch of math on the board. But before your eyes glaze over, I want to show you this. I have two things here, these being the prediction phase and, the, and this being the correction phase of the algorithm. Forgetting what the actual math is, you don't have to really read it, I want to divide it up like this. These two functions up here, f and h, are the only things in my entire algorithm that actually have to know what my vehicle is. They are the only parts of this algorithm that are vehicle uh, facing. So if my thing that I want to estimate is a quadcopter, then f actually tells me what the physics of that quadcopter are. They tell me the kinematic model of the quad quadcopter. And h tells me what my sensor readings uh, are, or how, how I interpret my sensor readings. h is how I, observe, how, how I take in IMU data and understand my state. So uh, when I first started studying this, I realized that there was this great big algorithm that was actually fairly difficult to implement. And I didn't understand why people were even going to the trouble of implementing it. Not, not that I'm grossly lazy or anything. I just didn't know why they cared. Um, the thing that struck me was, hey, there's only two lines of this entire uh, algorithm, if you look at it, that actually have to know what the system is. Maybe I can extract those and make things easier on myself. So. Uh, the red area is things that have to know about the vehicle. The green area is things that don't know, have to know about the vehicle. And when I started thinking about how to implement this algorithm in a software environment, I thought, OK, maybe I can take all of the plumbing of the algorithm, abstract that away, and hide it under the covers, take my f and h functions, and put those actual, actually out into a user-facing exposed area where a user can take advantage of them and touch them and play with them however they want to and tune the system to exactly what they want. So uh, what I ended up was this. I thought that the system was, I thought that my idea was common sense, and so I named it Kalman Sense, and I, I'm, I'm hilarious. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I've got two items here, basically, fundamentally. I've got a generic UKF uh, under, underlying piece that is like the entire algorithm, every single thing that I have to do that is not propagating states or propagating sensors. Every single other piece lives here on this side of the board. It's abstract and it's hidden. Uh, the user doesn't have to know about anything related to this, just that there is an, a UKF happening somewhere under the hood. What happens on this side is in the user-facing uh, part of the world, and it's both concrete and exposed. Everything over here is not abstract in, in the sense that there aren't any virtual functions. Everything is exactly laid out in a, in a truly explicit form, uh, and all of it is exposed to the user in that I'm not trying to hide it uh, in terms of underneath the nodes, uh, in, the, in the underlying plumbing of the system. So uh, what I do here, if I'm a user, and I am the user, so I have to dog food everything that I produce, uh, I have to 
provide my f of x, which is my process model, and I have to provide h of x, which is my observation model. I also have to provide uh, knowledge about what my sensors are. That comes in ROS land and in the form of sensor callbacks. I'm implementing all of this in the ROS robotics middleware uh, in order to make the piece of software that I produce uh, massively reusable, hopefully. Uh, so my idea here is that the system user uh, can create a class that will, be, that will contain a system model for whatever system they want to use uh, and put these three pieces of data into it. And then romance will occur. <laughs> Huh. So if the two pieces fit together correctly and if you follow good contract coding, object-oriented approaches to things, they will, uh, then you can actually get an arbitrary model for any system that all runs on the same algorithm, uh, which could be fairly powerful in the hands of a roboticist who had a bunch of different vehicles all for different, uh, say, uh, con ops uh, and wanted to be able to filter all of them uh, in some fairly easy, extensible, reproducible fashion. So. Uh, the system overview, this is how data flows through my system, so, excuse me, uh, uh, up here at the top, uh, I've got IMU data and POSE data coming from my IMU and my SLAM algorithm, respectively. Uh, that data comes into my uh, Kalman filter, so we've got this prediction correction cycle happening in here. Uh, and out of the prediction corrections, out of each of these actually, uh, prediction and correction will both produce a state. Uh, so a state estimate falls out uh, every time one of these runs, and then that state estimate is fed back in. Uh, and that's basically it. It's actually fairly straightforward. It, doesn't, it, it fits into everybody else's flowchart in the here's where the quadcopter is portion of the quad, or portion of the uh, uh, flowchart. This is what tells you where your vehicle is and what it's up to. Uh, I've worked very hard to try to make this simple. I hope that that's come across. <laughs> so the benefits of abstraction, I've worked hard also to try to make this part uh, fairly uh, subtle, I guess. Uh, so by abstracting away the plumbing, the algorithm is kept in the dark about what the system is that it's actually being used for. So I, as a user, can come along and I can say, all right, I have an underwater vehicle. It's going to operate autonomously doing this, that, and the other thing. It has these dynamics, these kinematics. Everything about the vehicle's sensors is put in here. Uh, and I want you to UKF this for me. And my algorithm will say, yes, OK, I will take your data and I will do work on it. Uh, by leaving the system model exposed, the user is given a fair amount of control over a lot of things, uh, particularly the model's granularity. I can have a really good model, or I can have a really low fidelity model. Uh, I can change anything that I want to about sensor input and output. And moreover, I can actually switch sensors out on the fly if I so choose. One of the things that I've been designing in our particular case for quadcopters is uh, being able to switch out SLAM algorithms. Uh, so if we decide that PTAM is terrible, but we really like SVO, or if we really hate SVO and we really want LSD SLAM, or we really want anything else that provides the same particular variety of data, we can switch it out uh, and in the future hopefully be able to actually switch it out on the fly. So. Uh, put simply, the parts that should belong to the user stay with the user, uh, and everything that the user should not have to know about, aka the actual Kalman filtering part of this, lives under the covers. Uh, the system models that a user provides uh, are reusable uh, and extensible in basically any way that the user can imagine. So if I have a fairly decent quadcopter model and I decide that I want to make it a higher fidelity model, I want to do a higher order interpolation of certain things, or if I want to be able to do a higher order Taylor series expansion, uh, I can just work all of that into an existing model and I can take advantage of code that I have already written and it should just plug and play. So, future work. Uh, the tragedy of this story is that now I have gotten to the point where all of the code is actually written and of course a flood happened. Uh, so, uh, flight tests have not happened. I have not actually integrated this into, this, into, any, in, into any system yet um, and now uh, I'm kind of just waiting on a code review to actually see if it's ready to go. Uh, but when I get back to Virginia Tech now, uh, the system, I'm going to test it against pre-recorded flight data. So what we've been doing as we've been running our vehicles is we've been running, uh, so everything's been running in ROS land. And what ROS provides us is the ability to take what are called bags, ROS bags of data. We're able to take recordings of data uh, in the time that they actually are produced in the ROS ecosystem and actually replay that data uh, as if it were happening live. So we can take an entire flight, we can record it, and then we can replay it for ourselves. So we've taken a number of these ROS bags, and my intention is to go back and actually do the 
the post-processing. I'm going to run these ROS bags with my Kalman filter running, and I'm going to see what kind of uh, state estimates fall out of them. I'm going to look at the trajectory that comes out of those, uh, the, the, the trajectory that is the uh, time history of those state estimates, and I'm going to put the pieces back together and see if that actually com actually corresponds to the Vicon ground truth that we got while we were running the vehicle. So. Uh, in addition to that, I'm going to characterize fault tolerance through artificial blackouts. What that means is I'm going to be running this ROS bag and I'm going to choose to turn off a sensor for certain periods of time and then turn it back on. Um, if the vehicle, if the state estimator system responds well to that, then I'll know that it's fairly robust and if it goes completely haywire, then I'm going to know that it's not fault tolerant at all and it's going to need a certain amount of reworking. And then, if all of those things go well, I'm going to actually start doing uh, live indoor and outdoor flights, um, where I'm going to be running on data that's actually being produced in real time, as opposed to being produced, uh, you know, just while I'm sitting on the couch waiting for this thing to run. Uh, and that's the future. So hopefully I'll also be able to uh, work GPS into it as well as a, another form of uh, uh, self-correction. Um, but I've started in the GPS denied sense because I wanted it to be principally aimed at GPS denied navigation. So I have some acknowledgments. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Danette Allen, my advisor, Dr. Kevin Kokersberger, Jim Nealon, Dr. Locke Tran, Ralph Williams, and the entire in Autonomy Incubator team. I know that I have annoyed a lot of the people in this room with a lot of programming questions over the last several weeks. I would like to thank all of you for your extraordinary level of patience. Um, it's been an incredible summer, and I have learned a great deal about Ross and a great deal about C++ and a great deal about resilience in the face of technical difficulty. <laughs> so thank you all so much for your encouragement and your support. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Josh? I guess my question is, what is the point of having the comment filter? Like, what purpose is it used for? Easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so my sensors are not entirely accurate all the time, right? So if I have a sensor for my IMUs are a perfect example because IMUs uh, are historically, uh, not historically, currently always noisy. Uh, they produce a great deal of off-balance measurements. Uh, so if I have, take in a bunch of noisy data and I try to correct based on that noisy data, that means that I'm just injecting more noise into my system. The point of the Kalman filter is that it actually smooths away a lot of that noise. Uh, so I take in all of this IMU data and I know that my vehicle is going to uh, behave in this particular way because I understand the physics of the physical model. Uh, so if I am running a Coleman filter on this thing, I actually get a certain amount of smoothing for free out of my algorithm uh, as opposed to just assuming that my IMU is good. Now where this becomes interesting is the actual state of the art, what the Swiss wizards as we've been calling them, the ETH Zurich guys have been doing, is they've been taking in IMU data as, as a particular example and they've been saying, okay, well, Worrying about how good our IMU is actually is kind of becoming a diminishing margin of returns game because our IMU is extraordinary and it runs at an extraordinarily high data rate. Why don't we just assume that it's correct? <coughs> Excuse me. So what they're doing now is they're actually saying, okay, the IMU is probably exactly correct. Why don't we just assume that that's the actual controls that our system is getting? And let's just assume that we can use those directly without having to correct them. Um, so that's actually what I'm now doing as well. I'm taking in IMU data and assuming that that is exactly what happened to the vehicle. Because these, you know, these vector nav IMUs that we're starting to use, um, they're really good. Um, so I don't actually really have to correct them at all. Pose data, on the other hand, coming from our SLAM algorithms, is, still has a fair amount of hair on it. And that is actually worth it for me to try to shave the hair off. Uh, especially because the SLAM uh, pose estimates are coming in very slowly, whereas the IMU data is coming in at an extraordinarily high rate. So in order to try to do that, all, do all, get all those smoothing benefits that I described uh, with, the IMU, with the IMU's data rate would be uh, computationally intractable, whereas doing that for the very slow, like 20 hertz or something, uh, pose estimate data rate is actually feasible. So, so okay. a follow-up question, if my camera measurements are so terrible and so slow, why do I want them? So the reason that we want them is because we don't have GPS and we need some amount of spatial uh, reasoning for our, uh, we, we need position estimates coming in, and those position estimates need to be uh, located in space uh, so what we're doing with a SLAM algorithm is we're actually building the map and we actually know our coordinates at a particular point in time. Uh, the estimates that we're getting from SLAM, uh, from PTAM in particular, are not terrible. <coughs> Excuse me. But they do provide a mostly accurate, most of the time, check on the system for when there's noise elsewhere. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much.